Um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, which is in the United States. Um, it's kind of like a working class, blue collar-esque place. Um, where I grew up, there was no conversations about art. Nobody still talks about art there. Uh, whenever I go home to visit, it's always like a big question of, what is it that you actually do? Um, which I always find really interesting. And, and to me, it's maybe like one of the most interesting things and the most interesting conversations that I have because I think the easy way is to kind of exclude those conversations and exclude those ideas. But to me, I'm, I'm really interested in like why, like how, how those differences can be shaped and, and that relationship between like not understanding and understanding can be played with. Um, this is the art that is in my parents' home. This is in their kitchen. Uh, when my mom sent me this photo, she asked me, please not to make fun of them. And I'm not making fun of them. This is just like a really great painting, I think, uh, because it turns on. It's got lights, as you can see there. And so whenever I go home, I always ask them, you know, this is a special occasion, I'm home, please turn the, turn the painting on, you know, which is kind of an odd thing. But, you know, it also, I think, there's this level of like, you know, you are an artist or, or whatever, and, you know, don't make fun of these things. And I don't think that it's something to make fun of. I think that it's something that really interests me in terms of, like, that language and, and what exists between those two. Um, my dad worked at this print shop when I was growing up. I guess, like, the last question is just, like, how did I end up in art, uh, art school at all? Um, he worked at this print shop. Basically, they had a graphic artist there who was responsible for... Um, making files for the for the presses and I fell in love with this girl when I was in high school at the end of high school and she was going to art school and I had no idea what I was going to be doing literally none and so that girl actually became my wife 10 years later um, but you know art was cool <laughs> she's here with me um, which is all the more fun um, but she was an actual artist I was just like Oh, art seems interesting, I can make things, whatever. Um, and so I applied to art school in like the very last months of, of high school, ended up getting in, and when I got in and I told my parents I was gonna go to college, one was a surprise, two, I'm gonna go to art school, the only thing that I could study in their mind was you have to study graphic design because you know my dad works with this graphic artist at the print shop, so you know I know you'll get a job. And I'm pretty sure that for the majority of the beginning of my career, he thought that was basically what I was doing for other companies, was just like prepping print files or something like that. So I guess in summation, I'm very interested in this idea, like this borderline between like the viewers of the work and the makers of the work. And how do you bring them closer together and how are the ways in which they actually end up being further apart in those conversations that take place between them? And I think it all started out uh, in college. I started learning how to code, um, which is kind of the easiest way, I think, to get into interaction or these ideas. And uh, we had an assignment. Um, this is kind of embarrassing work, but I think it's helpful to kind of start off this stuff. Um, we had this assignment to make a website for ourselves uh, in one of our classes, made a website, and then uh, we had to like buy the domain, all that sort of stuff. And by the time uh, it was ready to go home for Christmas, the website was really ugly, and so I wanted to make like a under construction website, as you do. And I had this idea that like it's under construction, like it'd be interesting if you could make it so that um, people could actually like mess around with it. You know, something that wasn't just saying like this website is under construction, but you know, there's something that was interesting to me in this idea that you could put it out on the web, anyone could see it, and then anyone could kind of make something out of it. Um, and in the like kind of bio for it, I was like, please feel free to redesign it. Um, you know, again, I, I wouldn't even at that point in time think of myself as an expert in design, and I thought like it's probably more interesting to see what other people would design with this website because I already know what I would design. Um, and amazingly, I got three people that redesigned this website, and I, I asked them to like send me screenshots of it. Um, it was a big campaign, not very successful. But I got this one, which is cool. Dunder Mifflin, well, the office was kind of popular at the time in the States. I think that's what this was a reference to. And then again, my loving wife makes a segue into this talk, who sent me this one. Um, so. 
very unsuccessful as far as like people actually doing anything with it. Like maybe six people saw the website in total. Um, but this idea of like making something that people could make something with was really interesting to me. And then I would spend like the next three years, like through grad school and then after I graduated, kind of messing around with this idea of like making something that people could make something with. Um, and it's also worth noting again, <laughs> This is the back end, this is kind of like the console log. If anybody's like into code, you know that this is extremely bad. Um, like, essentially bad. And this is the code, this is the back end for that website. Um, so it was like complete crap on the back, but the idea was out there. Like, the idea was able to be used and kind of played around with. And so for me, that was what was most successful about it. Years later, uh, I would end up at Google. Um, and one of the first projects that I worked on while I was there was having to redesign um, the site experience to apply for this project or this program called the Creative Lab Five. Um, the Five is like a year residency where they invite designers and filmmakers and coders to work within the Creative Lab, work on some self-initiated work, and then also work on stuff for Google. And their application was this. It was kind of like one of these uh, blank, infinite holes that you just put your email into and you kind of hope that eventually someone will email you back. And they asked us to just come up with like a simple idea for that. And we felt like, well, it's Google, it's kind of like a cool job. Like there should be, you know, something bigger involved in it. You know, it should be something more fun. Um, and also like, there wasn't a ton of people that were applying for this program. I think that they had maybe like a thousand throughout the year that were applying for this. And it's also just a very interesting program to be involved in. So I was also hoping to kind of raise that level of awareness a little bit. And so what we ended up doing, what we ended up doing was designing this website where you had this like base level of kind of shapes and objects that resembled what, it, what other than the Google website. Um, and you could use them and kind of move them around. You had 10 frames, you could make an animation from it. If you're a writer, you could write in it. If you're just like a strictly a designer, you could just make like a static image from it. Um, if you were a coder, there was like a whole thing that happened in the console where you had like special things that you could get. Um, so it was really trying to like speak to all these different people, but again, it was just like this idea of making something that allowed people to make things on top of it. And what was super cool about it is like, again, for me, like what's more interesting is other people's ideas. And so with something like this, you get this direct benefit of seeing with a really, really small tool set what people can do with it, and we got thousands of applications. I think within the first month, we had 8,000 applications. There's one person who's responsible for recruiting for this, and she was super pissed uh, because she had to go through all this stuff, but, which sucked, and I really felt bad, but it was also really cool just to see like all the stuff that people were making, like how dedicated people became uh, to this really, really like kind of simple, uh, barbaric tool set that we had put together and the things that they would make with it. Some were abstract, some were figurative. Um, this guy was like live tweeting. He found out who designed the site and he was like live tweeting at us his sketches and stuff and he definitely like hacked the code. I mean, it was just like really put actual energy into what is like a really, really simple interface and like I don't, I'm not even really sure how to make something like this out of it. Um, but it was ultimately just like a really interesting, another way of kind of making something digital that goes out into the world, people see it all over the place, and they can use, some, they can use it to make something with it um, as a way to communicate back. Uh, around that time, also while I was at Google, when after we had made that project, we kind of realized like we had made this really simple tool set that was kind of similar to like the programs that designers use, um, namely Adobe Illustrator. The issue being that design programs are super expensive for any of those who pays a monthly fee for Creative Suite, or if you pirated it. Nice, good job. Um, they're not a sponsor here, so I, right? I don't think so. Um, if they are, just cut it out. But design programs, super expensive. Um, and I started thinking back to like when I was a kid and how I didn't really touch like design programs until I went to college, like until I bought the laptop before I went to school. And when I got there, there was like all these kids that were like using Photoshop all their lives. They're amazing at it, it's super good. And I was just thinking about like, I wonder if like we're Google, like we make stuff for free and we put it out into the world. It'd be cool if we made a tool that 
kind of like provided this on-ramp into making things uh, digitally and into making those tools. Um, you know, it's not gonna be Adobe, but maybe it could start to at least like help people flesh out ideas or just like give them a sense of what it's like to use those types of programs. And so we ended up making this website called AutoDraw, which is free, um, you can use it. One of like the big features of it is it has this auto draw capability where we use AI to see what you're drawing and how it kind of help you predict it. So also it's kind of you know interesting to look at like people who say like, well, I'm not creative, like I don't I don't use things like that. I'm not a creative person. And using this like AI drawing stuff, we could kind of like prompt them into making things. They're like, well, why don't you just like start drawing a bike and just like see, you know, what happens and you start drawing a bike, you can have a bike that maybe is better than your bike. I mean, that's not my opinion, but maybe to you, you feel more comfortable with the fact that like, oh, this bike is actually better than the bike that I've drawn. Um, and you kind of like start to slowly like seed into that world where you're making things and you're kind of doing it in these interfaces that are the same interfaces that we're using and the same languages that we're creating in these really, really expensive programs. Um, and so this project was really about kind of giving that giving life to that or kind of like providing something that's free and accessible that hopefully could get people making things um, and kind of co-op them into, into creativity. Um, later on, my studio Haraf did uh, a, added to this like bank of thousands of drawings that powers the AI. Uh, we added these houses in, um, and they asked us what we wanted to do and came back with houses because we felt like people typically draw a house with like a square and a triangle on top of it. But the truth is like, many of us, most of us don't live in houses that look like that. And we always thought that that was kind of interesting and with this kind of predictive auto draw, it'd be cool if like there was houses for everybody. And so we ended up drawing, I think it was like 15 or, or 20 houses that were kind of all sorts of houses, which was a lot of fun. Um, this is a brief aside. Google ended up like tweeting about the, our little, like the fact that we made those houses and Google has 17.7 .7 million followers on Twitter, which is a lot. Um, and if, does anyone want to guess how many followers the studio got from that? It's, it's about six. <laughs> so I'm not really sure how that stuff works, but I don't know. Just like a helpful hint for you guys. It's, it doesn't work that well. Um, I was camping a few years ago, we were hiking, moss grows on rocks, and I was really interested about the fact that like, there's this legend that you can use moss as a directional tool, you know, it grows on the north side of the rocks. Uh, and I was thinking like, it'd be interesting if you brought that into somewhere where wayfinding um, is, is really necessary, like the city. And so I went online and started looking for moss, you know, like you do, uh, and you find moss acres. And uh, boom, you got a box full of moss in your apartment in New York. And I spent uh, the next couple of weeks going around New York, wheat pasting moss onto the north side of objects around the city. Um, the idea being that if you had any idea that moss grows on the north side of things, it becomes a navigational element, um, which was a lot of fun and got quite a lot of looks, as you can imagine. But what was interesting about it was like, then kind of putting something out into the world and seeing like people kind of like, what the, f like, what the hell is this? Uh, and really not even getting the fact that what I was talking about at all. Um, but the fact that they just engage with it in general was kind of interesting to me. Um, you know, here's a couple of people from Instagram uh, that had seen it and posted stuff about it just around uh, the neighborhood that I live in. And so it was kind of like this interesting experiment in like just having a, a kind of, not that really, not that good of an idea, but having an idea, going out and making it, putting it into the public, and then seeing how people kind of react to it, seeing whether or not they get this like conceptual big idea, or they just kind of like, what the hell is this? But either way, they're kind of thinking about it, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so still working at Google and I did that project and I've worked at a bunch of places, um, a small design studio called Sagmeister and Walsh and a big advertising agency called RGA and then ultimately at Google. And when I was at Google, I met uh, what are now my four other partners and we were all kind of having these conversations around like, kind of done, like wanna, wanna be our own people, we wanna be out in the world. Um, you know, we had been a lot of places all together and we kind of had worked on a few projects at Google and we liked working with each other and we thought, 
you know, why not? Let's try and start a studio together. Let's see if we can make money doing this stuff and kind of have our own rules. And that was the, the beginnings of HallRaf, which is the studio that I'm uh, one-fourth of, co-founder of now. Um, for those working on the pronunciation of it, uh, which is always a difficult thing, uh, I have this really mnemonic device, basically just like saw minus the S plus an H plus RAF minus the T, HallRaf. Super simple, just remember that. Uh, honestly, we thought the name would be a lot more simple to remember. It's just like two syllables, but it really becomes like the most difficult thing in a lot of client uh, relationships that we have. Um, and that's all of us. Uh, that's the four of us. Pedro wasn't there when we took this photo, so I added him in. Uh, he's a big, big inspiration, great member, love him to death. Um, and then I'm not really gonna talk so much about like the work that we do. I'm gonna talk about some of the ideas around the stuff that we're doing. So I'm just gonna show this little like one minute video that's kind of like a little reel of the, sh the stuff, not the shit that we do, the stuff that we do. Uh, so enjoy it. Oh my, my. It's much better. So we call ourselves a design and technology studio. We do stuff with brands, we do stuff with startups, we do stuff with big companies, little companies, um, kind of all over the map from identity work to websites to campaigns um, to even just like kind of explorational technology work. Um, that's a little taste of it. And this is the HallRaf website. And when we went to do the HallRaf website, um, we didn't have any work at the time because we had just started a studio. So one of the things that we kind of fell back on was this idea that like we could give people a place to draw. Um, we had this little like AI powered tic-tac-toe um, that no one has beaten and you never will because it's a robot. Um, at the time, Bernie was kind of a big deal. Uh, and then that email thing that you saw in the video. Um, but it's like a nice, a nice idea when you don't have any work is just to make something that like kind of embodies the work that you want to do. Um, it's been fairly successful for us. Oh, and the mobile site is really cool too, which you can check out now if this talk gets boring. Uh, you can draw stuff on it um, and it kind of makes the ball go in a certain way. Um, but maybe more importantly than that and something that I want to talk about here is this idea of creative accessibility, which is like a word that we made up uh, when we started the studio. And the big idea was like, if we're gonna start a studio, what is gonna be different about the studio that we start? Um, and we were really interested in like, well, what if we just spent the first spend all the time um, trying to make money, for one, because we have to pay our rent, but then what about just like putting out all of our processes, all of our like mistakes, all of our successes, all those things like that onto the web because there anyone can access them as a way for like people that might also be interested in starting studios to get like a little bit of a leg up so that they understand like what it's like for the first year of a studio. Do you hire a lawyer? Do you hire a accountant? Like all the sort of stuff that goes into it that we didn't really know. We were lucky enough to know people that we could ask, but we didn't really find like a definitive guide to any of that stuff. And so it was this idea that like we just publish everything and we would just try and be as transparent as possible as we ran the studio and hopefully that knowledge would be useful to someone. Uh, and the first project that we did in that vein was this project called the A to Z project, which was a 26 hours long uh, and for every hour, uh, we did an hour for every letter of the alphabet, and for every hour we would try to make something, uh, and we made a website, and we had like a live stream of it as a way of just like showing this whole process. We were a new studio, we felt like new studio needs a new process, and so that was kind of one of the defining factors of this. And so every hour, we would click this scrappy little tool that we had made, it would output a word and a definition, and we would spend the next hour trying to make something that reflected that word and that definition. 
and we did it for 26 hours straight. And during that time, we live streamed the whole thing. And this was about two and a half years ago before live streaming was a little bit more accessible and easier. Um, so at the time, you could only live stream for four hours at a time. And so we had kind of hacked together a bunch of different solutions. One of them was duct taping the iPad to the ceiling, uh, where we were running like a Google Hangout, because you could run Google Hangouts for eight hours at a time, so we would only have to change that three times. We had this little like fancy camera that you could run to Facebook Live but you'd have to change it every four hours. And so basically like, we found ways around being able to live stream for 26 hours uh, and give people opportunity to look into it. And this is what the site kind of looked like when it was up and running. Uh, we weren't moving that quickly. Uh, this is just for effect. Um, but you got a sense of like everything that was going into it. At the beginning of every hour, we would kind of like announce like what the thing we were making was or like the word, and then we would like show the whiteboard as we're like sketching out ideas and concepting and trying to figure out what we're gonna do, and then the mad dash to actually try and make something and upload it to this site where people could see it. Uh, along with uploading the work that we had made to the site, we would do this thing called highs and lows where we'd try and write like a sentence about like that hour. It'd be like, oh, the process this hour is really good. Like, uh, Nikki had a great idea and we just went with it. Or like actually, you know, none of us had good ideas and it was really hard to do this project, you know, do this hour. Um, but just as a way of kind of documenting as we went along and just again, just trying to religiously like document and open up this idea of the process. And we made all sorts of stuff. This was a photo series that we did at the New Museum uh, where we tied a ball of string to Nikki for attach and then I just walked as far as the ball of string would go. This is a house that we designed to live together in for cohabit, although now after running the studio for two and a half years, I don't know if there's any house that I could live in with all these people. Um, digit is like a form of measuring using your finger, so we made this little like finger ruler, and then we measured a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is like a short film about the moment right before something happens for initial. Uh, so as you can see, like a lot of these ideas are very small in their execution, but they were really pretty benefited by the fact that the idea existed. This was a music video for Jive, I think. She did like the Jive step. Uh, I think it's like 20 frames or something, but that was fun. And probably about like four o'clock in the morning, we're exhausted uh, and all of our friends and family <laughs> had gone to bed because those are probably the only people that were watching it. Um, and we were kind of like bummed out. We we're kind of like, damn, this is really hard. Like, 24 hours straight, just like restarting your process over and over and over again is actually very tiring. Um, and we started getting these messages on Facebook from this school in Australia. And we remember that, oh yeah, the world is big and there's different time zones. Uh, and they were actually like watching it at their school uh, while no one else was watching it. And so it was an interesting like, uh, I don't know, a way of just seeing the fact that like technology and live streaming is, is a really interesting way to communicate with people, um, people that are not near you at all and people that are all the way around the world as a way of trying to, to disseminate this knowledge and information um, throughout your work. This is what we looked like at the beginning, just brash, young kids, and then at the end is rough. Um, other things that we've done at the studio, this question around like how do you take or how do you decide which projects to take, we made this little flow chart um, for us and the way that we do it. The, the top of the list is it's something we believe in which in the process of making the flow chart was like started off very far at the bottom and then like as we went it was like oh shit like even for like a million dollars if it's selling cigarettes we probably still don't want to do it so actually that becomes like the top of it. And we worked with Fast Company uh, as a publication to like help publish that and kind of get that information out into the world. Um, again, just as one way that we do it, not as like the definitive way that it has to be done, but just this idea that like, that's a question that people ask us a lot. Like, how do you decide, how do you make money? How do you decide which projects to take? Like, this is a small look into that and something that we use quite often. Uh, quite recently, I think it was about two months ago, we did a huge article, like an exhaustive <laughs> article actually for uh, the Creative Independent where we went through our entire process of working with clients. Um, it was exhaustive. But within it, we talked about everything from understanding your value and how to calculate how much you should be charging um, or how much we charge and how we decide on what to charge, um, how we screen potential clients, like from everything from like discovery calls to like these IRL meetings to stuff like that, um, following up with clients, deciding on which projects to take, this flowchart again makes an appearance, uh, and then all the way down to kind of like sealing the deal and like what happens then, like 
do you send them an invoice? Do you send them an SOW? Do you send them a proposal? Like, what, what are all those words and what do they mean? Um, and trying to get that into like a place where it's just like one document that existed with all this information in it. Um, and again, like I kind of said this earlier, but in that we're kind of talking about this idea of like, our hope is like, just by publishing this stuff, it makes it available. Somebody who's interested in it, they find it, they're one step ahead of where we were because they don't have to make hopefully the same mistakes or do the same dumb shit that we've done you know, for the past two years and they can just start from where we've started at and be better. And again, it becomes more about their ideas and less about the logistics of running a business, um, which again is just like something that's really interesting. Rather see other people's ideas come to life than see if they can balance a checkbook. It's just not that interesting unless you're an accountant, in which case it probably is. Um, another thing that we do is called Hundreds Under 100. Uh, it was started by my co-founder, Carly. Uh, it was like a joke on all these like 30 under 30s, 40 under 40, 50 under 50, whatever they are, uh, award things. Um, we've all won them, whether we like it or not. Uh, but it was this idea that like most people don't win a lot of awards and it would be fun to like get people that were just doing interesting stuff together. And so once a quarter, we do these little meetups where we have like six to eight people give like little 10 minute talks. Uh, about the work that they're doing. And almost all the time, it's people that have never spoken before. So it's a lot of fun and it's like a real nervous wreck, but it's interesting to see, you know, those people who typically don't have the opportunity to give talks, be able to come in and, and give a little talk. And we do them at like the Ace Hotel uh, or different places around the city. And so it's just like another way of kind of opening up uh, the studio, opening up the process, opening up the things that go into it. Um, this is a talk that we're working on and we're giving at the Core 77 conference in New York in a, about a month um, where we're going really deep into like money and all that sort of stuff and like logistics. This is a graph of where all of our money comes from, um, which is kind of interesting to think about, like the relationships that actually make us money, the people that we knew from college, the friends of friends that we freelanced with, the companies that we used to work with, like who's giving us money ultimately at the end of the day? Um, because that tends to be another question that not only we still have, but when we talk to people, a question that they have, and it's a really valid question, like how do you make money? Uh, who do you ask for money, you know? Um, and so that, this is a talk that we're giving, as, I think it's like October, end of October, not important. Um, but we'll talk about that sort of stuff there uh, in a conference where people are trying to start things. Uh, and who knows? I don't know. Maybe someday we'll write a book about how to run a design studio. Uh, speaking of books, a project that I did with a friend of mine who runs a publishing company in Philadelphia called Sometimes Publishing. Um, he was interested. He's like, oh, we should make a book together. And I was interested in making a book, you know, like this, the desire of like the physical artifact. But I didn't want to just like make something that was, again, like this kind of closed loop. I was interested in like, how could you make a book that was still that open loop and still allowed people um, some sort of like uh, ability to do something with. And so I had this really simple idea. I said, well, why don't we just make a book where it's just lines. Like every spread is just like lines drawn in the book. Uh, and you actually use the book to take photos. You'd find those lines out in the world and you, you take those photos and that's what the book is for. The book really is just a tool. It's not a book. Uh, and he was into it. And so we made this book, Spiral Bound. I think we did like 50 copies of it, just like a fun little project. Uh, and these are some photos that I took with it after we initially made it. And it was just kind of like a fun exercise of like going out in the world, seeing things um, when you're in LA. But what was much more interesting than that always is when you put it in the hands of other people, uh, friends or people that I like just gave the book to and said like, please take photos with this. Um, because like the stuff that they do is, is always much more interesting than the stuff that I end up doing and the stuff that I end up thinking about. And so this is actually one of my favorite ones because it totally like kind of changes the way I was thinking about that it would be used at all. Um, but again, it's just like being able to like opening up the work to that possibility of the fact that somebody's going to do something that's much more interesting than you, I think is, is really a lot of fun and usually works out in nature in the city. Um, drones became available to purchase, I guess like a couple of years ago. Maybe, I, don't, I don't know the exact date, but they became available on Amazon like two years ago or something like that. Um, available if you have like $800. And I didn't necessarily have $800, but I was interested in them. They seemed cool. People seemed like cool people had them. So I felt like, you know, you should get one. Um, could make cool stuff with it. 
But I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just knew, like, I want to buy one and, like, see what happens with it. And they're super cool. And you can make, like, films and footage like this, uh, which is, like, super picturesque. Um, but then, at times, you crash it into trees. <laughs> and they're actually, it's pretty easy to fly, but it's also pretty easy to fuck it up. Um, and, like, as I've gone, I've kind of learned a little bit more, uh, more and more. This one, this one almost kind of caught it right. And, oh. <laughs> and it's like stuck in the tree. It has like the technology to kind of level itself out. And so it's always trying to level itself out. And so it's kind of hilarious to see it crash into trees sometimes. Although I don't do it on purpose. Um, but, so I got this thing, started using it, started crashing it into trees. Uh, and I started thinking about like what I could do with it. And what I thought was really interesting was like, the drone, when it's above you, it kind of makes the ground like a, a medium plane. Like you can draw, you could do things on it. Uh, and most importantly, maybe you could draw on it, which I kind of became like obsessed with right away of this idea of like the shifted perspective and the ability to draw on the ground because that meant like what becomes the medium, like what becomes the thing that you draw with. Um, and so when it snowed, I uh, would try and shovel. And then the other idea becoming like, well, what do you draw? And I got, I really like kind of gravitated towards this idea of like circles and straight lines because both of them are like nearly impossible to, for us to render like perfectly. You can always tell like when someone has drawn a circle or when someone has drawn a line because it's not perfect. Uh, it, ha it shows its humanity within it. This is a long video. It's showing in the, in the exhibition. If you guys want to see it, you can go see it there. I'll just jump right to the end. It's a pretty good circle. Um, and a lot of times people ask like, <laughs> Do you like mark it or anything like that? And I, I never mark any of the stuff. I'm really more interested in kind of the challenge of like trying to, to make that shape and trying to like do that uh, or trying to make a straight line or something like that on my own. Um, but almost all the time, it's not the first try. Uh, that was the first circle pointed out there that I drew, uh, which is really shitty. And I don't really know what I changed or what was different between the first one and the next one. It's just kind of interesting to me that like it becomes this kind of like consistent like exercise in trying to draw and trying to like understand, you know, where you are in, in space and how that affects what you're drawing. Um, this is another one that's part of that video that's in the gallery. Uh, this is just drawing, trying to draw a straight line in sand. This one also pretty long, but I think we get the idea and we could probably get moving. Um, this one is like walking in tall grass and just drawing by like matting down the grass as I walk. Um, this one was also like a third try on circles, so I think the other ones are like uh, to the left a little bit, but this one turned out pretty good. Uh, this is trying to draw a straight line, and, and what became like more increasingly interesting was the fact that like on the ground, these things look straight, or these things look like circles, sort of. You know, you don't, you can't really tell. Uh, it's not until you see it above that you really understand what it is. And a lot of, almost all the time, like 99% of the time when I do this, I just kind of like put the drone up and then I put the, the controller down and then I like go and, and do it. And I don't see it until I walk back over to the controller. Um, they're that fancy that they just stay there in the air. And so it's kind of like the surprise of seeing like, oh shit, I thought that was a circle, but it's like really terrible. Or I thought this was a straight line, but it's not at all. Um, and that kind of like, understanding or that kind of like guessing what it is, is is really quite interesting to me. I kind of went as far as like got one of my friends who has a dirt bike to see like what would it be to like draw with a with a dirt bike on the ground like in a burnout and just thinking about like what what constitutes like a tool for mark making. Um, is it just like the things that we're typically used to in art or can it be other things based on the the way that we're viewing things? Uh, and so that's kind of like the final image of that. But I had this like epiphany in it, which is that we all walk. Uh, if we are like so lucky to be able-bodied people, we typically walk quite a lot. Um, and going back to like that idea of trying to make things that anyone could make really is just about the idea. I thought like, well, what if you could just like walk? What if you just draw by walking? Like you don't need a dirt bike, you don't need sand, you don't need snow, you don't need any of that stuff. And so I started doing this work where I would do, I would like take video of me walking and then I would export like one frame per second and then I would just composite those images together and it would show the trail or the path in which I was walking on and using that as a, a way to draw. And I kind of became like really, really obsessed with it and just kind of interested in like 
what is, like, what is it? Why does it, why does it work? Why does it happen? Um, you know, but also really kind of excited about the fact that it was like a very, very low barrier of entry to like making uh, an image, making art, so to say, um, as lo so long as you have a thousand dollar drone, which knowing full and well that's not exactly super accessible. Um, and these are some of the early images and I started really liking them and started really kind of like getting into it and started messing around with like the perspective, like does it always have to be done uh, from above, can it be done from the side? And it kind of starts to become this bit of like a brush, like a, like a paintbrush type of vibe. And it also becomes much easier to do because you could just set up a camera with a tripod to do that. Um, and it becomes again like all about just like the land or the space where you are and the path in which you walk. So it's just like very simple idea and like playing around with like how many frames, you know, do you export? How many people do you have in, in the video or in the photograph rather? Um, these are, so yeah, just for clarification, these are all me. People a lot of times think that I have like a lot of friends who are willing to dress up in the same things that I'm wearing and go and stand in fields, but it's not, I don't have that many friends. Uh, sometimes, yeah. So this is all me. That was another conversation. <laughs> um, this is this summer, I was in Denmark at this museum. But, you know, it's been kind of an interesting, like, push and pull and, like, the language that it creates and the ability. Um, it's something as simple as, like, walking. It's, like, becomes very understandable. It, it kind of loses its flutency uh, in terms of, like, being something that's a very fancy act. Although I would say that there's a lot of thought that goes into it and just thinking about, like, you know, what is it and why is it that it exists. Um, this is from a series that I just did, uh, just commissioned to do uh, in... Brooklyn, uh, this is right by where I live. Um, this was done at like five o'clock in the morning. That's why there's no traffic. Um, people were, I had to walk around this circle quite a lot of times, which is the other fun part of doing stuff like this is that you just look like a crazy person all the time. Uh, plus a drone, it's just like not a, it's not a great look. Um, all right, like two more things and then we'll get a lunch. Uh, this is my brother-in-law, Dylan. He is an aerospace engineer. Uh, he makes this. He, he has worked on, he works in the R&D department of a company in California that works on things. Uh, this is a plane that flies vertical to horizontal. He's a very smart guy. Um, a few, like I guess a year and a half ago, I was out in LA, we were having this conversation about like how easy it is to buy and deploy weather balloons. Um, how you can buy them, everything that you need basically for like 150 bucks. And you can put something into the stratosphere which is kind of insane when you think about like flying planes and shit like that. Like this is a, it's a big balloon uh, and we could just buy that and do it. And he was like, you know, I'd be super interested in doing it. Yeah, there's all this like technical stuff that goes into it with the winds and how the winds change as you go up. Um, he's like, you know, if you have any ideas, a reason to do it, you know, we should do it. And because I was doing all that like stuff, messing around with the drone, I was thinking like, well, bigger is definitely better. It's like, it'd be cool if you could make a drawing that was so big that it could be photographed from space, from like the stratosphere. Um, and so he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so he went to work with this idea, bought all this stuff. We ended up figuring out that like to draw, uh, to draw on the earth, so to speak. Um, we settled on this like white plastic that you could buy like hundreds of, of yards of at a time. And uh, we could use that to kind of like lay out and draw. And of course, like every, good graphic designer who's doing a project, got to make a little logo for it. And so he did these like flight jackets, it was a lot of fun. And I set out like trying to draw now with this plastic sheeting. Um, and so this is like a very sped up video of trying to draw what other than a, a circle uh, in a random, well, not in a random field, in my wife's family's farm field um, outside of Philadelphia who think that I am insane. Um, but I'm here, so, you know, how could you be insane? Uh, and so I draw this circle there, and the idea was like, with this one, hopefully we would get, we like set it, ideally so the balloon would pop at 25,000 feet. We thought like, this is a circle that's like proportional to what we would end up drawing. If we could photograph that, then ultimately that would prove out the fact that we could photograph something 45,000 feet, which is ultimately the stratosphere. Um, this is the only photograph that we ever got of it. This is at 1,400 feet. This is from the drone. Um, this is the tool, one of the tools that we used uh, 
to predict the wind. It's called windy.com. Again, it's interesting to me that like these sorts of things are available online. You can find them. It tells you what the winds are aloft, what the winds are like hundreds of thousands of feet up in the air. This is a big tool for us when we're doing this project. So we put everything together. We packed this camera into a styrofoam box, put my phone number on it in case somebody found it, in case our GPS didn't work. <laughs> what, a, what a novel idea. Um, and you know, we set out, we bought, I don't know, like 90, I forget what the measurement is for helium, but we bought a huge thing of helium, which is typically used for welding, which the guys were very confused about why we needed it or why we wanted it. Um, but we bought it, filled up this balloon with it. You can rent it, you can rent those for like $40 um, and with all the other stuff. Uh, and so we went about kind of making this balloon and then setting it off into the world. And that was the last time that we ever saw it, uh, was as it floated away. What happened is that as it went, um, as it got above, we're using one type of GPS that when it gets above cell tower range, it loses connection completely. We didn't know that. Um, and so we like had pings every two minutes until a certain altitude and then who knows, it's probably like on top of someone's house in New Jersey somewhere. Um, but left a phone number on it, so hopefully someone will call. And at 11.55 p.m., I get this text message. I found it. What? Really? <laughs> Where are you located? I was like very, very excited. <laughs> we just spent the whole day trying to do it, and then we were like, shit, we just lost this whole day's worth of work. And never got another response from this person, <laughs> ever. I, 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 did, I like almost wanted to show the rest of the I like messaged them like five more times, like, please, please. <laughs> you don't understand. But I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know. This is a coincidence, I don't know. I like, we looked up the number, we, it got a little stalkery for a second, then I was like, okay, it's not, that, it's not worth it. Um, so this summer we tried to do it again. Uh, this time, updated GPS, a lot of updates made from the learnings on the first one, much better weather, uh, it's hot out, not cold, better looking balloon, better looking setup, pink styrofoam this time, uh, another camera, another GoPro in it, um, which we were sacrificing to the, the art gods. Uh, and we set out to do it again uh, and try it again. We had the same field, similar circle, uh, set it off. And this time, we were able to track it the whole way, tracked its path uh, as it went up, its altitude. It's interesting because like the predictions that Dylan had made based on the calculations, it basically fell right into that uh, line, uh, which was super interesting to me because I had no idea what he was doing up until that point. Um, and it landed, and we got the ping when it landed in this tree, about 60 feet up in the air, or 20 meters. Um, much too high for us to get, which was really unfortunate. Uh, and it landed in this patch of trees, which I have to say, like, if you look at all the fucking fields <laughs> next to it, it's like, come on, <laughs> just one break in this shit. <laughs> Uh, and so, no breaks. <laughs> We're currently waiting uh, for the weather to get cold uh, there in Pennsylvania and that the leaves will fall off the tree and hopefully we'll be able to get it from the tree. Um, but, you know, and we'll try it again, probably, for whatever reason. The one thing that I did realize, and I've kind of talked about it a little bit, and this is getting into the last project and then maybe questions, maybe you guys just want to leave. Um, is like this idea of drawing on the ground, uh, whether it's just like walking, whether it's shoveling snow, whether it's like with this project, like trying to lay out this line that could be photographed, is really interesting because you don't have that perspective of whether or not the this, this shape is right until you see it from above. Uh, and also in that, I got really interested in the fact that just walking around it and drawing kind of enact the same process, right? You're thinking about like, where have I been before? Where am I going in, in the future in terms of like my walking and like the, the line in which I'm walking and using that as a way to understand like, okay, I think this is a circle because like, I've always been turning like a little bit and I've been doing it, you know, on a very reasonable basis. So this must be a perfect circle. Um, and when I got asked to come here, they asked about like if proposing an installation and I was really, interested in this idea of like, could you do a drawing um, on the ground that was only really visible uh, in its entirety if you walk the entire thing or if you see it from above, which I think most people will just see it from the ground. And I got to know 
Bucharest, and I got to know the National Museum of Art of Romania through Google Maps, um, which again is something I think that's super interesting because it's just like a website. It just exists and it tells us all of this sort of stuff. I mean, I walked around the space digitally many times before I walked around it physically. And I proposed this artwork where we'd draw a circle around the museum. Easy enough, right? Uh, very simple idea. But ultimately what I was interested in was the fact that on the ground, like it, this is cool, this is a very cool image uh, to see, like this whole circle drawn. But what was almost more interesting to me was like these segments of it that people would be interacting with, the fact that this idea, this like art idea would exist outside of the museum, that would exist in our normal space, that would intervene into the places that we are and that we go every day. Um, and people would see it in chunks like this. You know, and it would kind of have this question of like, what is this line, like is this a circle? Is this just a curve? Like what is it that makes up this thing? And I thought that it was interesting, it was really interesting to me was the fact that that's the same process that I'm going through as I'm making the work because none of this will be marked. Ideally, we'll make this tomorrow. And none of this is marked, it's just by walking, uh, hopefully in a circle. And that's kind of the same way that they'll observe it as well. It's like not really knowing until you've done it what it is. Uh, and I, I like that idea that the work can be open and can kind of, I think in like terms of those initial diagrams, this work is like, what I'm adding to it is a very small portion of it and what the viewer and what the person who kind of stumbles upon it adds to it is it completes the rest of it, um, which is much more interesting, I think. Um, and I proposed this work not having any idea um, how we would go about making it. I had some rough ideas, and this is Ramona, who's in the United States. She just had a baby, and congratulations to her. Um, it's a friend of mine who was kind of helping like facilitate a lot of this, and I sent her some of those sketches, and uh, kind of immediately there, the team here, for whatever reason, liked the idea, and you know we decided to go forward with it. But after that, there's like, a shitload of questions like what can you use to like spray a line that big like how do you make the paint like what is the paint how do you walk and spray at the same time how big will the circle be all this type of shit to figure out that I had no idea and so I basically spent like the next six months testing and trying to figure out how this would work trying to ultimately make a paint that would be natural and when it rains it would go away uh, and it would cause no harm to the environment which we ended up figuring out that I could make out of calcium carbonate and water um, I bought the first pound of it off of Amazon, like I buy a lot of stuff. Um, and then did a lot of testing on pieces of asphalt because they're redoing the roads outside my apartment and so they would like bust them up and then I would like go out and like grab these chunks of road and be like, oh, this is great. I can like test the material, like it's a road. Uh, which again, like, it's just an odd thing for people to see someone like grabbing a bunch of rocks and bringing them into an apartment in New York City. Um, but it was very useful. Uh, and this is a video that I sent over a while ago just showing the fact that like off of this test and water, it goes away. Kind of like proving the, the concept that we could do it. Uh, and then I went on to buy much bar larger bags of this calcium carbonate, which easily accessible through the internet. This is like a popular uh, substance that's used by farmers to lower the acidity in dirt. So it's something that we could get anywhere, uh, which is also important to it. Uh, and then went through testing a shitload of sprayers. Um, this is the first one that I bought out there testing it. And I was able to make this, which is maybe like 1 20th of the size of the circle that will exist here. Um, but it was kind of like a proof of concept, but Ultimately, it clogged basically at the end of that. And so I would spend the next couple of months trying to figure out like which sprayer I could purchase from Amazon <laughs> that I could use to spray this stuff. Uh, and at what ratio the uh, water to calcium carbonate powder would work, um, be able to be sprayed. And I have a studio in New York. This is inside the studio uh, where I was literally testing, painting the lines on the ground in the studio. Um, just as this one was like a test of like how wide the lines would be uh, and then just testing those ratios out as I went. Um, this is another test of that out in the wild. This is an unsuccessful test. I was only able to paint one line and the, the sprayer clogged. So I had to go back to the drawing board in terms of like what we'd use to paint. This is a much more successful test. 
although it's multiple different ratios. Um, as you can kind of see in like the opacity of those lines, some of them are brighter white than others. Um, another test. Ultimately, it was like just a lot of fun throughout it, though, is trying to figure out like how, how to make all this work and how to bring it all here to Romania. Uh, I really didn't end up finishing it until about three weeks ago. I was in Maine on vacation, and I spent a whole day standing over a four-gallon bucket, like spraying into it and then dumping the paint back into the sprayer and then spraying back into it, much like this, to make sure that at the right ratio we could have the right amount of paint be sprayed through this sprayer all at one time so that I knew, based on like these calculations that I had made, that we could spray this entire circle and not have any problems. And so we literally just did that like three weeks ago uh, and, and figured out <laughs> that this would actually work. And ideally tomorrow at 6 a.m. we will do it. Um, I don't think we've gotten like official okays from the city yet. We're still waiting on that stuff. Uh, but it's been a lot of work, and I just want this slide for Floriana, who I don't know if she's here or not, but she has done a ton, ton of work uh, in making this possible and kind of going back and forth to City Hall to try and get the approvals that we need, so thank you to her. Um, and with that, I would just say, hopefully, this was kind of interesting. Um, I think that there's, I think personally, there's a lot of interesting things that people have and the ideas that people have, and I think that it, when we create work that allows for those ideas to be seen and allows for that communication to take place, it is much more interesting. And so I guess I would say, if it's interesting to you, you should probably try it. Uh, if it's not, that's okay. You can just forget this whole thing ever happened. And that's the end. <laughs>